Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Laura Darling. I am new to Front Porch, but I'm very excited to be working with the full Front Porch organization. I um, started with Covia and have been their VP of Communications and Spiritual Care, and now I get to do this for the full organization, which I'm just I'm just so thrilled um, to get to know you and to get to be part of of this uh, this whole group. Our topic today is emergency preparedness as we observe National Preparedness Month in September. And so we have a number of guests and speakers who will be speaking to their experience at their different communities. Each community is different and the emergencies are different. And frankly, every emergency situation is different. So please take into consideration that these are some ideas that have worked at different communities, but your community will also have its own unique way of approaching emergencies, depending on the kind of building that you have and how many people live there and what kind of emergencies are likely to happen where you are. So take this in mind as an inspiration for some thoughts about how you may want to approach this with your community, um, either as a resident or as a staff person. But also be open to new ideas as this is something that you will be able to develop that's uh, particular for where you are. So I want to start by introducing our guests for today from Walnut Village, Judy Phillips, from Spring Lake Village in Santa Rosa, uh, Jim Randall, from Vista Del Monte, Laszlo Negi Berta, my co-host Justin Weber, who is from the home office, formerly Casa de Manana, and currently where? I'm at Wesley Palms today. San and Diego. Wesley Palms. So we've got it, we've got it covered north to south. Um, so if you have any questions as we go, you're welcome, of course, to put that in the chat. I have a number of co-hosts who are going to be helping to keep an eye on any questions that come in. We will have time for questions at the end. Um, also possibly some discussion in the meantime. But I wanted to start by asking our panelists about their experience in responding to an emergency. And I'd like to start with Judy. Could you talk about uh, ex uh, your emergency experiences at Walnut Village? Okay, here's a uh, kind of a, a quick overview. Um, our emergency is most likely to be an earthquake. Um, there's no known fault under our building um, and we don't prepare for fire or other emergencies. We focus on earthquake. Um, Walnut Manor preceded us and it was evacuated and torn down and it was constructed right after the building codes were changed in Anaheim. We're, we're across from Disneyland. Um, and so we have been told by the fire department that we have the safest um, senior residents in Anaheim. Um, so we think we'll be pretty good uh, when the earthquake comes, but our concern is what happens if we lose power and would we have to relocate. So we have a three-story building that has three courtyards and 10 cottages that are a single story. We have about 200 residents when we're full. So in 2017, we created a plan because there was a 5.7 La Habra earthquake and it was just eight miles north of us. So it shook the building pretty well. Things fell off the shelf and there was no response from the staff to check up on people. And so one of our residents said, we need to do something about that. So we have a program that's been um, designed by the residents and then uh, there's an incident command system that's initiated by the staff. Uh, so um, what the, um, the person who was concerned about it happened to have been a former police chief in Anaheim. He talked to the fire chief and said, how should we get organized? And uh, they, they told us, uh, you know, we should have someone supervise each floor and then we should have people under them that walk each hallway and then we should have a backup for each person. So we have about 40 people on the team. We wear yellow vests. Um, we have walkie talkies 
and we're using a, a Midland walkie-talkie right now. We had a previous one, but we found out this was good and it works for us. Um, we wear best walkie-talkies and have clipboards. And then we have a paper we call a status sheet. And we figure if we lose power, we're gonna need something like this. So every block has the name of, uh, has the uh, apartment number, name of the person, and then the issues they might have in trying to evacuate. Do they use a wheelchair, motorized wheelchair or cane? Do they have pets? Do they have hearing problems, vision problems? And uh, do they use oxygen? Those are the main things we, we try and keep track of. Um, and then we ask everybody after a duck cover and hold to hang a door tag on their hallway door, um, their exit door, and it either says okay or it says help on the other side. So we ask them to hang the door tag. If it happens to be a vacant unit, then we hang that there so we know we don't have a body inside uh, to look, look out for. And um, since 2017, we've only had three or four smaller quakes. Um, we did feel the Ridgecrest quake in 2019 on July 4th and 5th, and that went to 7.1. So we felt it, but we didn't respond um, to it. And every time and that brought up the issue of how big does it have to be before we call out our team? Um, so uh, is it big enough to worry the residents or would there be injuries and damage? So what we've come up with is, is uh, have the top people who are the floor coordinators get on their walkie talkie and say, how, how bad was it on your floor? And um, if, if it's bad enough, then we call the rest of the team out. Um, and um, so we hold two earthquake drills a year and we hold two training sessions a year separate just to keep people fresh on their walkie talkies. And we have an orientation PowerPoint that we give in a class setting. So that's my brief summary. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, Spring Lake Village, what kind of emergencies are, is that community preparing for? Interestingly enough, when, uh, when I first came to Spring Lake Village about eight and a half years ago, uh, the focus was on uh, earthquake. And uh, there, there had been a, uh, a resident emergency preparedness committee that had been created about 2010 and uh, they worked with the administration in making the preparations and, and uh, helping them in the conducting of drills and a lot of the things Judy was talking about in terms of monitoring the conditions of the residents in their buildings. Um, and then in 2017, we had a wildfire and uh, we were evacuated. Uh, we were off campus for about two weeks. Uh, and the role of the, the uh, Resident staff, resident emergency preparedness folks was to get the people evacuated. We have 23 uh, uh, either buildings or cottage groups on our campus, about 450 residents in independent living. Uh, each uh, building or cottage group has a lead warden and one to three associate wardens. So we have about 80 people that are involved as, as part of our warden staff. Um, a lot of their time is spent in terms just talking to residents, staying in communication, keep getting updates on physical conditions, who drives, who doesn't drive, who has a walker, uh, the various things that similar to what Judy was talking about. Uh, and then uh, in the event of the evacuation, it's the wardens that uh, take role in their building or cottage group, uh, account for each of the residents in their group, and then get them into their cars. We have uh, assigned carpools for people to uh, evacuate the campus. And uh, quite frankly, in 2017, this had never really been tried before and it worked amazingly well. We evacuated the whole campus in about 45 minutes. Uh, so that was, but since that time, all of our preparations have been focused around wildfires. Uh, in 2019, we came right down to the last minute when the wind shifted. Uh, and so we didn't have to evacuate in 2019. We did evacuate again in 2020. And in that circumstance, the fire was coming down the hills about two miles from us. And you could just watch it come as we were evacuating. Um, so we've had a, an intensive effort in the past, uh, in 2021, to improve our procedures uh, to the, as, as best we could so that we don't go through the stress of having the fire coming towards us. The fire, camp fire has not impacted the campus. We've not had any fire on campus. 
but obviously it's stressful. And uh, this time of year, uh, it's, it's stressful for all the residents just in anticipation. And we're trying to provide the residents working with the administration in putting together information to keep uh, people apprised of, okay, these are the steps in an evacuation. Uh, these are the steps in getting transportation together to get people out of here. This is where we will go. This is where uh, a front porch will be uh, endeavoring to book accommodations for us in the evacuation so that people are assured that they're not just gonna be on their own and, and, and left behind. Uh, I think the most important thing that, that we've learned over the last couple of years is just communication, 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 uh, both before, during, and after. Uh, it's just essential to keep people advised as to what's going on and uh, make them feel comfortable with that. Um, I guess something that was said at the outset was every emergency is different. And I would say that uh, we have learned something after every emergency. Uh, and we don't really refer to it as, as an action plan that we have. We refer to it as a response plan. You know, it's the actions that we will take in response to whatever emergency presents itself. And uh, it's, it's dynamic, it's always changing. And, uh, and we have, uh, we have a, the residents and the, uh, the staff have an extremely good working relationship in doing this all together. And uh, quite frankly, the, the support we've gotten from Front Porch and the main office uh, in preparing for things and over the last several months has just been terrific. And it's, it's given a lot of confidence to the residents. So that's sort of where we are. That's great to hear that you're getting a lot of support. And I also heard you talking about the teamwork between staff and residents. And so that is a really nice segue to be able to turn to Laszlo and hear about how you have worked with uh, your residents and how you have worked with training your staff for preparing for an emergency. Thank you. So I'm kind of glad to hear that, you know, we are not much different than any other communities. So we're pretty much practicing and, and uh, uh, getting ready for the emergency preparedness of, of other properties. So uh, just for start, so we, we implemented a disaster training for our employees. First, I want to go with the employees. So in the next, the first five days when we're hiring someone, that person has to be attend a disaster training, which is probably hour, hour and a half long. And we basically explain them everything, how the system, what they have to do in case emergency, certain emergencies, fire, earthquake, active shooter, you name it, all kind of emergencies even uh, uh, broken pipes, uh, fire sprinkler lines is broken. So also we're providing a map for them, map for them, uh, make sure they know where the, all the equipment located on the property in case uh, uh, management is not on site or maintenance person who's on duty injured or not able to assist with emergency response uh, artists like the fire department who came coming on site. So we had in the past just well, the reason why we started that because in the past, like several years ago, but probably six, eight years ago, we had a fire in our property. And uh, unfortunately the staff uh, wasn't able to assist the fire department when it came on site. The, the fire was stopped by the fire sprinkler, but they couldn't shut the water off. So it flooded several apartments at the same time. And the time when they find the shut off well for the fire sprinkler where it damaged like six apartment, I believe so it's needed fully renovated. So it cost so much for the community. So basically, we, we this, when I heard the story, we decided to go with uh, preparing our staff to be respond. So in, in case if you're not your department, like nursing uh, servers, they I, I don't expect them to know where exactly the location of the well, but we have map close to two different area, posted two different area on the property. I want them to show to the fire department, here's the map. This is where you guys have to have to go. This is the web location. So that we don't have to deal with that kind of uh, disaster when, you know, it's simply a, a, a few minutes work, you know, you can shut the valve off and, and save so much uh, financially. Uh, other than that, we have, uh, when they're doing so, this is the first five days, they have to attend the hour, hour and a half orientation. Uh, I'm not orientation, I'm sorry, disaster training. And a few weeks later, our HR director is scheduling a orientation uh, for the staff, the new hire staff, and uh, every director has a, a short period of time to uh, introduce themselves and also talking about, you know, what they're doing. 
So part of my job, I take it up for the two short and every emergency generator, where are the, are the shutoff valve for the buildings, every single building, the domestic water, the fire sprinkler, the irrigation, you name it. Also, where is the main gas shutoff valve for the property in case earthquake, because we have an earthquake valve installed not a few years back. So in case, you know, we have earthquakes, so we have to contact gas company and show to them, you know, how to reset the uh, earthquake valve. Uh, uh, so, so they attending this meeting and also uh, I implemented a couple of years back. Unfortunately, since the COVID started, I, I wasn't really able to uh, have a safety meeting with the residents because the restrictions, local uh, agencies restrictions, but I had a, a monthly meeting the beginning, like let's say like four years ago, I started like a monthly meeting with the residents and we, we, we find, uh, we selected different topics for the residents, how to prepare for uh, fire, how to prepare for uh, earthquake, uh, what to do in the holiday season, uh, the decoration, you know, make sure not using open flame, make sure they're not plugging, uh, overloading all the electric circuits and, and just give it some, some kind of advice. And obviously we, we always has an open uh, question on the end of the presentation. And also I, I was looking into what they want to learn, what they want to know. And what I find out the residents is very, very eager to learn what kind of safety equipment, what, how our operation works, how, they, how much they save, how, what we can do for them. So they, they want all kinds of information. And, and I, I always prepared you know, what they basically was asking for. It's not what I wanted to pre uh, uh, present to them, what, what they was asking for basically. But the most, I can tell you right now here in Santa Barbara, I think the most, uh, concern about the fire. As you may know, we had the Thomas fire a couple of years back and right after the Thomas fire, we had the flood. And unfortunately uh, with the fire, we, we, we had a, a very concerned residents. They, they were looking for actually update daily basis pretty much. So what we did actually, we basically a daily basis, daily basis every morning, I printed out from online, all the updates from the fire department, I posted on the main launch. So make sure residents who don't have any TV they're able to look at the, uh, the board and be able to get some information how the fire status is at this moment and how far the fire is spread, spreading. And uh, and the same time had, uh, I, I took some initiative on that. I, I personally, I, I went to the that zones where already unfortunately burned on, took some pictures and I showed the residents how devastating it is for the certain people around us who lost their home and, and what we can do to make sure our property is not, okay. So make sure what we can do to make them more feel safe in our property. So I, the same time I, on the, my presentations, I hired, the, not hired, but I contacted with the local fire department who willing to came to our site and help me out with all the presentation, fire preparedness. And they were able to explain to residents, you know, there's not much concern for us regarding the Thomas fire because it's kind of far away and it's, it's almost impossible to reach us. So, so we did a lot for residents and, and I definitely, I would like to continue to train them. And unfortunately the COVID just came in and we had certain restrictions that we still have to follow. But uh, I, I really look into that and I really love to work with the residents and listen to their concern and, and you know, respond to them. You raised a, a great point, and, and Jim also spoke about this, and of course, it's near and dear to my heart about the importance of communication and just, you know, that people are anxious when they don't know what is going on. So thank you. Thank you both for, you know, for speaking to my job and also, but just the importance of how, how helpful it is, even if you can't do anything just to know what is going on, how important that is in, a, in an emergency. Um, okay, uh, Justin, last but not least, I did want to ask you about the importance of our communities in reaching out to the greater community in an emergency, because I believe that is part of your experience in emergency response. Yeah, thank you. I, um, you know, it was an interesting way to come about it. All three of the previous people had, had you know, done such a good job planning and, and kind of getting people together. Uh, my experience is I, I joined our industry in 2007 as a marketing coordinator for another nonprofit senior organization here in San Diego. And a couple months later, the wildfires of 2007 hit here in San Diego. 
And um, uh, the organization I was working for is located mostly in the downtown area. So we knew the fires weren't going to affect us. Um, but it was a Monday morning and our CEO got several of us around the conference room and said, this isn't going to affect us, but it's going to affect a lot of others. And how can we help them? And kind of looked around and she knew that I was kind of the new guy and said, you probably don't have a whole lot to do compared to everybody else here. I think you're going to, uh, why don't you coordinate our response? Um, and so I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I kind of just started, I uh, called many of the senior organizations in the areas that the fire were happening in, uh, called the Red Cross, called the Salvation Army, called um, a lot of different areas and, um, and just kind of let them know that we were available. Um, and so flash forward to the next day, 24 hours later, Tuesday morning, I woke up and in the San Diego Union Tribune, it said, if you know a senior that needs help, call this number. Uh, and it was my personal cell phone number. Um, and so complete accident, that's just somebody had posted that. And so that week um, worked quite a bit um, and just got calls for everything. I mean, we had, we had seniors that were laying on the gym of San Diego High School. We had seniors that were at Qualcomm Stadium without medications, without caregivers. And I just really kind of helped coordinate a lot of the efforts to get those people the help that they needed to the places that they needed. Um, everything from housing people to transportation. Um, we got buses to areas that were affected and bust people out of there. Um, we housed people at the organization that I was working at. Um, and throughout that week, uh, just, just a lot of effort uh, went into trying to respond to something that wasn't very well planned for as a network. Um, so when, when things died down and everybody went back home, um, one of the things that came from that was a few months later, I got a call from somebody at uh, Aging Services of San Diego, and they were looking to put together a what they called an RCFE disaster task force. And so really trying to network the communities like ours within San Diego County, uh, both on the sk skilled nursing side and then on the on the residential side. Um, and so something something really good came from it because the task force still meets here on a quarterly or monthly basis um, with a lot of people in different communities. Um, when the wildfires um, a few years later hit, things were much better responded to. Uh, they weren't looking for some, uh, some schlub like me who had just started to try to coordinate things, but they actually had real people that were, um, that were connected and doing things. Um, so it was a really good learning experience, I think, for the city. It was a great learning experience for me. It kind of cut my teeth in the industry. And uh, honestly, from there, the CEO kind of said, hey, you've got leadership skills. We need, to, we need to put you into different areas. And so it was from there that I kind of, that I kind of made my way in this industry. And so I'm very lucky for um, for a tough opportunity turning into something that, uh, that really helped a lot out. But um, to your point, I think communication is always the key. Um, you can plan as much as you want, um, but you never know what a disaster is going to look like. Uh, prior to taking this role at, at, at Front Porch, I was the executive director of our community in La Jolla, Casa de Manana. And we, we talked about everything from tsunami preparedness to earthquake preparedness to fire preparedness. Um, knowing that fires probably weren't coming to our community at Casa, but if they did, how would we respond? And, um, you know, a lot of people think because Casa's right on the shore that uh, there's a tsunami area, but turns out we found out we're not even in a tsunami zone at Casa. So we were all relieved of that, but it was a good education experience as we went through that. So um, the more we're prepared, the more we talk about it, the more that we're connected, the better off that we're going to be. Um, because when when things go wrong and you need help, um, you need to you need to have gone through as much of the preparedness as you can. So, um, you know, I, I think from from an executive director standpoint, putting that hat back on, I am so heartened to know that we have residents that are leading the charge um, at these at these at these communities because um, you know you don't know when or or how these will happen, and, and the more people that are that are involved and know what they're doing, the better off everybody will be in the long run. Absolutely. And so I am seeing a couple of questions coming in, but I did, before we go to questions, I did have a couple more uh, just to build the building blocks. Uh, Justin, you were talking about how you, you build those connections. And one of the things that was really heartening was to learn how Walnut Village and Spring Lake Village have been connecting and working with each other to help one another with their emergency preparedness. So Judy and Jim, how have these two communities, which are so far apart, been helping each other and been working on emergency preparedness together? Well, Judy, if I, if I may go first. Um, it's interesting, uh, our uh, representative to the board, Barbara Porter, came back from a board meeting, I think in July, saying that the folks at Canterbury Woods, which is a community in Pacific Grove near Monterey, 
uh, wanted to know about our emergency preparedness because they are also in a wildfire zone. And so we, uh, uh, she helped put together a, a, a Zoom meeting between myself and some folks at, uh, at Canterbury Woods and Judy got wind of it and joined the thing. And so that began the discussion. And uh, so it's really the, the three communities, uh, Judy sharing her experiences on the earthquake things. And we had the experiences of the wildfires. Uh, to help the, the Canterbury Woods people feel more comfortable with the directions they were moving in their preparations. So Judy, feel free to add anything to that. But. Well, what we learned from Spring Lake Village uh, solved a, a couple of problems for us. For a couple of years, we went round and round about what will we do if we need to relocate and the pets will not get into their carriers. And should we leave them behind? Do, what do, does the person stay behind with them? Does the person take the next bus? What? And we couldn't come up with a solution, but Spring Lake Village has figured it out. So we're going to adopt their program. And uh, they're uh, allowing the pets to stay behind, but you notify the management as you leave and the management, you leave food and water for them and a pee pad or a scratch box uh, for the cats. and. Um, and then you let the management know that you've left the pet behind and they'll look in on it and they'll refill the water in the food dish. So we like that a lot. We're gonna, we're gonna make that our policy. The second thing is that we're planning to relocate if we have to by bus. And we have a contract with the bus company we use regularly, but what if the bus can't get through? And so we're going to adopt your driving plan and create some carpool ideas. And we know that there's constant change, so it'll be an, uh, a big project to take on. But we do have people who still drive here and a lot of folks who don't. And so we'll eventually, we're gonna put together a driving alternate plan. So we appreciate learning uh, what Spring Lake Village has been doing and maybe there'll be something else we'll find about in the future. We, we've learned some things about earthquakes from from uh, Walnut Village because, <laughs> frankly, since the wildfire started coming, we have pretty much left earthquakes on the back burner. <laughs> but uh, we know we need to bring that back uh, to the fore. All right. And speaking of earthquake preparedness, Judy, could you talk a bit about the Great Shakeout? Yes. Um, on the third Thursday every October. Uh, there is a great shakeout. Um, there were um, 29 million people who participated in 2020. This year so far, 16.3 million people have signed up. They like to know if you're involved so they can count numbers. Um, this is our, our team. On the left is our management team. And on the right are some of our workers, our residents who are wearing their vests and in the middle, she has a, a walkie talkie and a clipboard. And in the middle is our assistant resident incident commander who is writing down the problems as they come into him. Um, and so we part we've been participating for about the last four years. Um, mm -hmm. We have to start our drill uh, this is a full-on drill with the staff and, and our team of 40 people. And so we have to start our drill with a fire alarm because we don't have any kind of a PA system in the, in the whole building. And so we put the, the drill on pause and um, let the people who are listening in for the uh, alarm know that we're doing a drill. Um, our goal is to locate every resident, make sure they're okay. And if they're not okay to get help to them, but of course we can't go into their apartment. So we ask them to hang the door tag. And then if there's a door with no door tag, then we have to check to see if their car is not in the garage. Maybe they've gone to the doctor or shopping or are they out with our transportation team and they've gone to the doctor or is it just there's no door tag and then we call the nurses and say, go into the apartment and see what you can learn. Maybe they got trapped under a piece of furniture that fell on them. Um, and let's see. So the people who aren't in their apartment and can't hang their door tag, we ask them to go to the ground floor courtyard. We have three floors. So each floor is assigned a, a courtyard. And um, we wait to find out when the staff tells us that they've checked the building for safety and then they, they are allowed to return back. 
Meantime, the staff is looking at water and power and gas to make sure that those uh, are all okay and turned off if they need to be. Um, and when the whole thing is over, and it takes us half an hour to 45 minutes usually to run a drill, um, we all, um, those of us at the floor coordinator level, uh, gather and talk about what worked and what didn't work. We write it up and we look for a, a way to improve what didn't work. All right, fantastic. Uh, Jim, could you talk a little bit about the recent uh, fire evacuation drill that took place at Spring Lake Village? Yeah, we were, uh, our evacuation at uh, last year in September in 2020, uh, the evacuation from campus worked reasonably well. The, the notification to go by the county, which we had waited for from the county, came a little bit late and created a lot of stress. But um, we wanted to make some changes in where we were supposed to go. We had to wait for the county to tell us where to, where to evacuate. And we were contacted uh, late last year by the fire department, Santa Rosa Fire Department, and they made a recommendation that they could provide a, an evacuation site for us uh, to leave campus and there to sort of gather and then distribute people of various accommodations. Um, and a park uh, about eight miles west of here in the western part of Santa Rosa, it's an area that is, is oh, well, nothing's fireproof as we're learning, but it's, it's well out of the way of any anticipated wildfires. It's, it's, it's out in the plains in the Russian River Valley. Um, and we work with the fire department on that and they have agreed to have us give us a, a designated area there that they will open up in the event of an emergency evacuation situation here in the, in the Santa Rosa area. And so we had a, uh, a test evacuation uh, in, I think it was in May. And uh, we do have a speaker system throughout all, all the campus and they have a, a loud alert signal um, and then the message would, would be transmitted. And uh, we did it in two stages. We didn't try to evacuate on the drill, the whole campus at one time. We did the East Campus first, and then about an hour later, we did the West Campus. But it gave us a chance to take, have people get in their cars, go out to the park, understand where it is, understand how to get there, understand what to expect when they get there in terms of being checked in, uh, meeting people who are going to come and pick them up. If, if you've got friends and relatives that uh, are going, they're going to stay with, those friends and relatives can come to the park and pick them up there. So it, it doesn't have income. So we don't have incoming and outgoing traffic uh, when we're trying to evacuate. Uh, and the drill worked okay the first time on the, with the, uh, the East Campus folks. And then we stood around and talked about it for about a half hour after that one before the next group came and it worked much, much better the second time. So we learned a lot from that. And, and you know, now there are, there's a key staff person who's assigned to manage it out there uh, at the park. There's a key staff person that manages the evacuation here, uh, working with the committee of the, of the residents. Uh, and of course the, the health staff, the resident health services and skilled nursing facility, those people are, are handling those residents in those types of, uh, with those types of needs. Uh, and it, it worked amazingly well. And uh, now our administration essentially has control over when we can va evacuate. You know, last time we had to wait and wait for the county to tell us because we didn't know where we were supposed to go. Now we know where we're going. And if our management looks at the situation, uh, the emergency situation and sees that it's developing, and working with the fire service that they continue to give us information, uh, they can say, okay, we're going to evacuate. We haven't gotten the official notice, but we're going to evacuate. And they'll order the buses to come and pick up the people that need buses. They'll activate the uh, carpools among the independent living residents. And we will all either, if we have passengers that we have to take out to the park to be met with others, we'll do that. Some people will simply be leaving to go to stay directly with friends and relatives. Uh, that's okay too. But when they leave campus, we have to know who's going where. And there's a checkout procedure that we, we will do to know who's going where so that we can account for everybody when we leave. Uh, but the, the, having the park as our destination now makes just a huge difference. Because uh, uh, 
our, our administration really is, is much more in control of, of when we go. And that is huge. Well, I think that your experience also speaks to the importance of a drill and the importance of practicing what would happen in case of an emergency, because, you know, it's not that uh, the group on one side of campus is smarter than the other group. It's just that at that point, you knew better what it was that you needed to do because you'd done the drill and practiced. Yep. So, yeah. So I think that uh, I also want to turn to Lazo and also Justin to talk about uh, how our staff prepare. Um, you know, the, well, just go ahead and talk about what kind of drills and preparation do our staff need to do, um, you know, all the time. So as you can see in the picture, that's a funny picture. I took that picture actually, that's a couple of years back, probably three years ago, four years ago. So I, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I had a good relationship with the fire. I have still have a good relationship with the fire department and they have a safety trainer who's recommended to do a, a, a fire extinguisher training, a real life fire, fire, fire extinguisher training with the staff. And the reason why, because they said, and also I believe too, if the staff is prepared, we can save life and also asset also for the companies. If they know how to do, I'm very confident to step up and do what they're supposed to be doing. So, and, and most of the emergency situation, uh, I think the human nature is like you're panicking, especially when you have a fire. I'm not sure how many of you get close to any real fire, but the experience is that when people are getting close to the fire, the heat actually, it's, it's the, the, the person who starts, gets care from the heat and they start backing up. So I want to make sure when the, the we have, if in case if we had a fire, our staff very confident to use the fire extinguisher and make sure they know how to use it. So I, I basically, I uh, uh, ask the fire department to come on site and uh, give us a real fire, fire extinguisher training, what was mandatory for every single staff member the directors, the ex executive director, the nurses, the caregivers, the cooks, every single person have to attend this meeting just to feel and experience how, how does that feel to stop a fire, a small fire. Because if you have a small fire, if you know what to do, you know, I, it's easy to stop. But once it's spread, it's very difficult to stop. So the fire department came on site, they lit up, as you can see on the picture, lit up a pan uh, full with liquid. And basically every single staff member, one by one, have to go over there, get the, you have to use the PASS mode, the P-A-S-S, pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep mode, and they have to extinguish the fire. And I can tell you right now, it's very, it was very enjoyable, and few staff members was, came to me after the meeting, and they, they thanked, me for, thanked me for setting up that training for them, because they said they never had some, something like the experience. They always had a training like, like verbal training, how to use the fire extinguisher, fire extinguisher, what to do, but they never experience in real life. What is, how does that feel to be close to a fire and, and very confident, you know, stop the fire. Other than that, uh, our staff is actually trained for uh, all kinds of emergencies. So we, we uh, honestly, we try to train our staff to make sure they are prepared in case no management on site. So as like uh, Judy was mentioned, Walnut Village, our staff is also uh, activating the incident, incident command center in case the management's not on site. So every single staff member knows what exactly they have to do. So in case emergency, we have a, a shelter in place for the residents. Also, the staff has a, a, a location which is actually uh, assigned like a main office at this moment. So everybody have to meet over in the main office. After hours, the nursing charge basically taking over and give assignments to their, uh, all the employees, what they're supposed to be doing. They're assessing the residents, they're sending to you know, the certain areas, memory care, assisted living, uh, public areas, find out, you know, how the, uh, the employees, the, any injury, any damage on the building, uh, what needs to be repaired, any emergency uh, agencies has to be notified right away for, for, you know, even gas, let's say the gas is making somewhere. Do we have to, what do we have to do? Shut the wall, gas up, 
who do we have to contact with the fire department so so we, we try to train our staff to make sure they're very confident they know what to do until the management is uh, responding coming on site after hours and i can tell you i'm very confident our management is very responsible we we have several discussion monthly basis talking about disaster and and we training ourselves to make sure if we have anything happen, any kind of earthquake, fire, flood, like we had, not flood, but a mudslide, like a freeway is closed. Everyone responding on timely manner. They're coming to Vista right away. They know they have to come in. They have to report to Vista. They have to assist with all kind of emergency. And, and I'm really hoping our residents also feeling and, and trusting us to responding to them on all the time so they can count on us. All right. And before we go to questions, we're going to questions right after this. But Justin, anything else that you think our residents or the, everybody <laughs> should know about how staff prepare in our communities for emergencies? Yeah, you know, I think Laszlo covered quite a bit of it. Um, you know, it starts from their very first day at orientation. You know, there is there's orientation on disaster preparedness and, and what we do in these types of things. Um, you know, I think the other thing to know is that there's a lot going on behind the scenes that a lot of residents wouldn't see because we, we train at every shift. Um, our, our overnight shift people are trained on, on emergency preparedness, fire preparedness, those types of things because uh, our communities don't close as everybody knows. And so people at every shift need to be able to, to respond to situations um, as needed. You know, I think the only other thing would be um, to know that it's, it's, the power of an organization like Front Porch is awesome in that, in that as we come up with good ideas, as we come up with good training topics, as we come up with good training tools, we share those. And so um, I've been part of many a meeting at Front Porch where, oh, we did it this way and then it gets implemented at another community. And so that's, um, you know, that's really the beauty of, of conversations like this as well, because it sparks good ideas and it sparks good practices at all of our communities. Um, but it's a 24/7, 365 gig, um, and we're all on. We're all on when we're here at our communities, as as ready to respond. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to go back here, and I saw a question back here at 3:13. Jen asks for Spring Lake Village. What did your team learn about how people respond differently and emotionally to a disaster? And how were you able to handle all of the different kinds of ways people might react in an emergency? How many different people do you want to hear about? <laughs> um, most people are aware enough of what our procedures are that there are very few issues that they know they need to get in a carpool, they know they need to go, or they know they need to go over to be put on a bus with the assisted living folks. We've talked about that ahead of time. So there, there, we don't have too many surprises, but I remember in 2017 when the alarm went off, uh, the first thing I realized is that uh, one of my drivers wasn't here. So suddenly we had to reallocate people in cars. And it was just really important, I think, for the, for the lead wardens in each building or cottage group to be comfortable that they knew what they were doing to, and that instilled a confidence in the residents that. <laughs> People that knew what they were doing were moving forward with it, even though we're just residents like they are. But uh, I think that that was was really important. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the different reactions came afterwards when you when you got back and people had a chance to think about it and well maybe this maybe that. Uh, but then it was the staff problem to deal with it, <laughs> not so much us ours and trying to help get them out, but. Uh, we've, we've tried really hard in the last couple of years just to keep people informed. And I've had people that I don't know come up and, and say, you know, that report you gave at the resident council meeting, you know, I feel so much more confident now about what's going on. And it's that type of, of providing information that I think uh, builds a level of confidence and comfort that, you know, the people that are heading things up here, and I'm not just talking about the resident people that are involved, but especially the staff, they know what they're doing and they're going to do it in the best interest of us, of the community. Yeah. And I can tell you, cause I was answering a lot of phones during those evacuations that, you know, residents seem to be taking it very calmly. The yeah. families of residents were very unhappy and very anxious. The ones who weren't quite sure what was happening. 
And so that was one thing that I thought was really important to know is how do we communicate and make sure that people who aren't on site know what's going on and so that their loved ones, they know that their loved ones are okay. Uh, I got a call from someone in Scotland. I remember that one very clearly, wanting to know what was going on. I got a call from someone who was very upset, wasn't sure where her mother was, and then called me back 10 minutes later and said, guess who just showed up with her cat carrier and <laughs> she's fine. So, you know, so there's a lot of confusion. And I think that's the hardest part in the, in the thick of an emergency is, you know, not having information even to share because you're not clear yet on what's happening. And so there's, there's definitely, I found different phases of the emergency. There's that immediate emergency response, which is very confusing. And then you kind of settle in and you, you kind of get a grip on things. And then as Jim mentioned, the return where you have to deal with the kind of the grief or the aftermath of having gone through something really traumatic and that can be just as hard because you feel like it should be fine now, but you have to deal with some really difficult things that you went through. One, one let me add one thing that we've added this year is, is right before last year's evacuation, they implemented a system called One Call Now. And that's where uh, the administration can, can call uh, every resident, call every resident's uh, emergency contact person with the push of a, a series of bus, buttons. It's a sequential thing. You can't just get to everybody at once. But at three steps, when the, a red flag warning is issued, we use one call now to notify all the residents about that and their key contact person. When a, an evacuation warning comes, we send out a second call and they're contacted and they get the, the inf updated information. And when an actual evacuation is mandated, they get a third call and that goes out. And we have also, the med administration has contracted with a call center so that that number, every resident will have that number in their go bag so that uh, they will be able to give that number to anybody that they're with or any of their key contact persons that, to make communications back and forth so people won't try to call, get a recording, not get an answer, whatever. They can call the call center. The call center will redirect the call to where it needs to go and make the connections. So I think those are two big steps forward in that type of communication with the families. Absolutely. Okay. Well, speaking of systems to reach people, Eileen asked, are loudspeakers used to notify or update residents that I know that Jim you talked about the the PA system at Spring Lake Village and Judy that there wasn't one at Walnut Village so how do you get messages to everybody when there's an emergency and when they should react Judy go ahead I'm, I'm trying to unmute Judy here there we go yeah we have a bullhorn <laughs> And um, our cottages are not connected even to our fire alarm. So we have to use the bullhorn to let them know when we're going to have a drill and when it's finished. Um, other than that, we have our walkie talkies and everyone, um, we have several channels. So every floor has its own channel. And um, so, you know, third floor coordinator talks to his block captains and the block captains can walk down the hall and talk to people. That's as close as we can get. The other thing I'd like to add um, to your previous comment was that we have a lot of people who live here who've had uh, counseling training. And so we've created what we're calling an aftershock team to talk to people after the disaster. And they're all uh, selected to be very good listeners. And so that's an added thing that we put in. That's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a question that I'm not sure who will be answering this. And there may be some other folks on the call who have information on this. Why are residents not permitted to use the evacuate evacuation chairs in an emergency, especially on weekends, insufficient staff available to assist second floor residents down the stairs? 
And that is oh. a question from Sandy and Bill Boyd at Vista Del Monte. All I can say from up here at Spring Lake Village, when I asked a question about that, I was said, don't touch it. You're not trained to use it. The emergency response professionals will come and use that if necessary. We did do gate training. So we have the belts at the head of each staircase so we can help residents down that need them. Uh, and you may get lucky, especially in our situation now, we're more likely to be able to get out when we still have power. Uh, the previous two times we didn't have power and so we had to be helping people down the best we could. Okay. Yeah, Laura, you know, the only comment that I would say is that every community is set up differently, um, but training on those chairs is crucial because um, I've ridden in one of those chairs and you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be sliding <laughs> down uh, uncontrollable. I can guarantee you that. So, you know, they are there to help trained people get, get those that can't get themselves down the stairs um, down, but I would just, you know, every community is different how they're set up. Yeah. Um, uh, Another kind of emergency. Oh, sorry, Judy, go ahead. I think it would be a, a, a insurance issue that the residents should not put themselves at risk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another another kind of emergency that again that's being shared by Sandy and Bill Boyd. A uh, really good question. What measures have you taken in case of excessive heat, as occurred in Oregon this past year? Not all apartments have air conditioning. And in case of a power failure, the ones that do exist would not work. And this is particularly Vista Del Monte. Uh, so Laszlo, maybe you have an answer for uh, heat, heat questions. Absolutely. So our building is not uh, uh, equipped with air condition, unfortunately. And what we're doing actually providing portable air condition for the residents, so every apartment. So we purchase a quite few air condition because certain buildings is facing to the the side of the area where the is, I mean, the sun is always hitting the building, so it's hot. So we're providing portable air conditioning for residents. And also we just started last year installing air conditioning for the building. So one of the building, we just, uh, 12 units, we just installed in a public uh, meeting space area. We installed air conditioning last year and we actually am in the process right now getting estimates and coordinate with the other, uh, hopefully the whole entire buildings. I mean, not the entire building, the second floor area so see we're working on it slowly unfortunately the time when the campus was built it, it, uh, the, uh, the environment you know the the temperature is not about wasn't that high so nobody was thinking about it necessary to install air condition but now we get to that point when when the climate is changing and it's necessary to make some certain steps to make sure our residents living in comfortable life and and not overheated, yes. So we're providing portable air conditions. That's great. Um, I also am gathering from Grant Edelstone, who is our Senior Director of Risk Management, is talking a, a bit about the emergency preparedness plans do include things like plans for power safety, public safety power shutoff, cooling centers, charging stations. Um, and maybe Jim, you can talk a little bit about how Spring Lake Village has responded when there have been these public safety power shutoffs and what that might mean for uh, heat emergencies. We have uh, emergency power for the, uh, the what's called the West Grove part of our campus, the four newest buildings on the west side of the campus. Uh, so that's not an issue there. We have a number of, and they've completely redone the emergency power uh, generator for the the main building that were the offices, the, the dining facilities and so forth are. So that would always have capability of, of uh, power air conditioning in, in an emergency. We're in the process of upgrading uh, the emergency power for other buildings, although we have a number of uh, small emergency power units that can, can do certain uh, areas on campus. But, it's an upgrade that's in process to uh, uh, have emergency power for all of the, the main campus buildings uh, over the next, I think, three years. All right. Uh, Mike asks, are there any proactive steps family members can take to help our communities better take care of their loved ones during an emergency or disaster? I guess I would say to, to talk about it and, and, and 
you know, are they prepared? Do they have an emergency go bag? Do they have a plan? You know, do they understand what that looks like? Is there a communications plan? I think talking about it and it goes back to that communications piece. Um, the more, the more you think about these things and communicate these things, the better. Yeah. Talk with their loved ones about being prepared in that way, having their go bags and talk with them about meeting them at the park. Don't come to the campus <laughs> as if we're in, the, in an evacuation situation. Uh, we actually have one family that they've already arranged that uh, they'll be able to come pick up the pet, but uh, that will happen even at the, ver the very first stage of the alert. If there's a red flag warning, they'll come pick up the pet. But uh, once the, it gets to the point of uh, potential evacuations, uh, don't come to campus. We'll, we'll get your loved ones to you. I have, uh, <laughs> from, from um, Walnut Village, we have these barcode tags that are um, tear off. And there's one spot where the family contact name is supposed to be filled in ahead of time. And so as you leave, you put one, each of these on a bag, and then one goes on your pet carrier. And if we need to leave, the idea is that we call this contact person and let them know that we were leaving. So I, I, that's just one other thing to keep them appraised and, and make sure that we have their name already on the tag. Right. All right. Um, we only have a couple of minutes till four. We have quite a number of questions. I'm happy to keep going. And if you can stay, that would be great. If you can't, then understood. But I, if it's okay with you, I'll just keep asking some questions. I think this is a really good topic. I'm going right. to need to leave by about 10 after four. All right. Well, we'll end by 10 after four. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how many days of food and water are on hand at the community? And I think this, uh, is this the same in each community? Three days? Three for us. At Walnut Village. Mm -hmm. Is there a standard for that? Yeah, I, yeah I there's don't. a regulation that every, yeah, three, three days um, emergency food and supply. And most of our communities have more than that, but that's, that's the minimum. Right. Our food is uh, freeze dried with a sterno to be able to heat it. And it's enough to feed both the staff and the residents for three days and plenty of water. Very interesting. All right. Our residents helped to create and update evacuation bags, Eileen asks. We review the go bag list regularly, uh, incorporating uh, suggestions from residents and making sure that every resident gets one and make sure every new resident coming in we have a letter that uh, I don't think marketing was real happy about it, but when people sign a contract, they get a notice about emergency preparedness <laughs> uh, but even before they move in. So they're aware that they need to have a go bag, just of the things that are needed in it and arrive with it. So uh, uh, we're pretty aggressive about trying to have that in everybody's hands. We have made it optional, um, but we are requiring pet owners to have a carrier for their pet. And we have about half the residents who've chosen to buy or make a go bag. Bert from Sunnyview asks, how can we get management to put in a PA system as a high priority? We had one that was abandoned because it never worked well. We have many folks with vision impairments and they are especially unhappy at not knowing what is going on. Mm. I can't help with that, but our, our <laughs> things, you know, it goes into your budget process and it's usually a multi-year thing. And it, it, you know, there are always choices to make and you can't do everything at one time, but you gotta be building towards making it better. That's the same here, Vista Del Monte. So we have a PA system as well and we're testing it every year. But I can tell you right now, we have some issue. Uh, every time is different areas where the speakers won't work. We have to do some repair, so it's 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 a quiet work to keep mm -hmm. maintaining the equipment and make it always usable and work, make sure it's working condition condition. But our residents is very very demanding on to make sure we are we have a, a working PA system. So in case emergency, and I think it's actually a good idea where we had a power outage not too long ago. Uh, it was a plant. Edison was uh, doing a power shut off for several hours. It was like probably six eight hours. So we we were able to communicate 
you know, residents update on the PA system concept. So it's 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 very usable, definitely. And in case emergency, I can see it's very helpful to notify the residents and keep them on informed all the time. So yeah. Um, yes, Judy. I think when they rebuilt Walnut Village, they decided not to put it in um, because maybe it was too much like a hospital, and. Um, I don't know that, but I, that seems logical to me. So it's, we're too fancy to have a PA system or something. No, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it, it, it would be very helpful for disasters. You know, one, one thing that this raises for me is, you know, PA system is one way, but, but the solution is how do we get information to everyone efficiently? Yes, it can right. be a PA system. It can be some other kind of alert what you know whether it's a pa system or whether it's some other solution and there's lots of new solutions now with the new technologies what is the way that we can get the message to people in a way that they can understand and it gets to them efficiently and it can get them the information that they need so it may be a pa system but it's you know thinking bigger picture what is the problem you're trying to solve and so i think that's the thing to raise with your management uh, and I think that also actually speaks to the next question we got from uh, Sheldon and Sandy. Uh, should management give something more than stay in your room as a disaster plan and orientation? Mm -hmm. uh, we've been discouraged from even asking questions. Well, hmm, and just given the stay in your room. Well, uh, I'm going to turn that over to some other people to talk <laughs> to, to talk about. Um, I'll, I'll volunteer. Emergency. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. Our our building because it's recently been rebuilt. Um, they tell us that we have we live in a concrete box that's fire safe, and that for that reason we should stay inside. If you leave, especially in an earthquake, there are there's debris that is flying through the air, and you could be hit. And so stay in your room actually for us is the best advice. Um, and I don't know if you're in an older building, if that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Shelter in place is always what we say for an earthquake. You don't want to get out. You want to stay in your, in your structure uh, for the fire uh, or an evacuation. Obviously, you're, you're going to get out as quickly as you can. Uh, but we have for a building fire, not a wildfire coming in, a building fire, those the building that's infected, uh, affected by that, you'd have the alarm go off. We have evacuation areas outside the building where people will, will leave the building and go to that area and be safe uh, on the campus. Uh, but if it's an evacuation, obviously in a wildfire situation, we want out. Uh, we want to get them from their rooms. We want to get them with their go bags. We want to get them in their cars. We want to get them on the road. Yeah, I, I just want to add also, yeah, I agree. And, and every emergency situation is different. So obviously when we have the fire, so our building is it's pretty fire rated, pretty uh, uh, covered by fire sprinkler and every single entry door is fire rated. So we, we also tell the residents uh, shelter in place, wait for instruction. And because it's safer there inside the room than walking on the corridor, maybe it's in the flame or something. So. Mm -hmm. So we're going to notify them, obviously, and, and with the emergency crews coming on site. And we are very lucky. Our fire department is actually like a few minutes away from here. So any emergency, they usually hear in less than four minutes, actually. So we have, I've always told the residents the best thing to do, shelter in place, wait for instruction. Somebody going to knock on your door. We're going to notify you, be a system. Some way you're going to get notification. But I agree in case of earthquake to actually safer than stay inside the room than walking out, leave the building because all the glass tires, tires for the for the rooftop and, and just so many things could be danger out there. So it's better to be sheltered in place. Thank you all. That was very informative and kind of answers the question of why <laughs> that is the instruction. That's that was very helpful. Um, I have one last question for you all before we wrap it up. If you could only do one thing to prepare for an emergency, if, if what would you advise someone to do if they were only to do one thing to prepare for an emergency, what would you suggest? 
Get your go bag ready. <laughs> I took that question to mean, um, what would I like if there was only one thing I could do? And that is to convince uh, two categories of residents, one of whom decides that we're never going to have an earthquake and will not prepare. And the other is they're convinced the fire department is going to come and rescue us. And the fire department has to do a triage of the city for three days. And they say, we won't see them for three days. So they need to prepare. And so those are two groups that are difficult to deal with. <laughs> Laszlo, Justin? Uh, go bags. Have a go bag. That's a, that would be my best piece of advice. Have a go bag ready to go. Yeah, pretty much same here. Just uh, go bag and uh, you know be patient. Wait for instruction in case mm -hmm. you have a chance. So yeah. I think it's better. Like I, we just discussed it a few minutes ago. Better you know stay in put, wait for instruction, shelter in place, and when you notify to leave the building, make sure you have a to go bag to go. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all, everyone, um, for joining the call today. For Thank you to our panelists for your participation and your insights. Thank you all for being patient and staying a little extra time. I appreciate that. Our next Strength of Community chat will take place on Thursday, October 21st at 3 o'clock, and it will be on the topic of exploring creativity as Katie Wade talks about the image of self project that is just wrapping up. Oh, it, it looks like there is one more question. I am not seeing that question from Seema. My, my question is this. I'm really concerned about weekends, you know, from Friday night until Monday. I'm thinking during the week, uh, I, I feel fairly secure. But it's, it's the uh, nighttime, which we're very low staff, and the weekend that we're very low staff. And that, that's really what has me very concerned. I guess my response to that is we are staffed over the weekend, but not at the same level as during the week. But every person on that staff is aware that they could get called in in any circumstance. And they all have radios that they know when there's a red flag warning and they're alert to that. And uh, you know, so it's a question of, of readiness not necessarily the number of people you have on hand at that exact moment, but that the, the, the entire cadre of, of people that are necessary are aware okay. that they need to be ready. Santa Maria and uh, Sandy here. and Bill. All right. I would like to suggest that a future state of the organization meeting take up the issue of how we are preparing uh, to be more resilient in the light of climate disruptions and climate change. That's become a very big topic. And I think that uh, every uh, front porch organization needs to look at what they're doing to, to uh, support the uh, reduction of, of carbon dioxide and other nitrous oxide emissions to the atmosphere and how the different disruptions could affect them personally from sea level change to drought to water floods uh, to excessive heat and so on. That would be a good topic for another meeting. It would indeed. Up, oh, John. Sandy, we agree with you. And we're going to start that conversation with Mr. Del Monte next week. But we're going to take that conversation to all communities. Thank you for bringing it up. You're welcome. Thank you again to everyone for being here today. It is 4.10 and Jim needs to go. And I appreciate everyone for being here. And uh, we will be back again next month.